Welcome to Veterans in Transition, where we promote the veteran community. Each week, we travel around the region highlighting veteran-related news, issues, and events. I'm Stacy Redman, an Army veteran, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. In this episode, we'll learn about a new VA initiative designed for women veteran business owners. She's 101 years young, a World War II veteran, and still giving back. And this Marine shares his cancer battle story. First up, Cortez Riggs is the CEO of the Military Influencer Conference. Started in 2016, the conference is a mentorship and connection hub for future and current military veterans looking to make the military transition with an entrepreneurial mindset. Thank you so much, um, Cortez, for talking with me today. Um, I found your event on social media. I'm Fantastic. glad to be here. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me, what um, prompted you to start this Military Influencer Conference? So it started out of a personal need that I recognized that I had several years ago. Um, I wanted to be an entrepreneur when I grew up. Um, I retired from service after 21 years. Uh -huh. However, the path to entrepreneurship for us as service members, as veterans, is not as simplistic as a lot of people assume it to be. Mm -hmm. So when I went through my transition process, it was a matter of I'm yearning and looking for entrepreneurship style of content. Mm -hmm. I wanted there to be something that would really um, help me to understand the steps that I needed to take to really build, launch, and grow a business. Mm -hmm. There was some minor stuff, but after sitting through a transition class for a week, the talking point centered around going back to school or getting a job. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it wasn't in my DNA at this point in my life to do anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the Military Influencer Conference began to solve my own personal need with the support of USAA. It started just bringing people that operated in a digital space, the content creators, the freelancers, the mm -hmm. bloggers, giving them a platform where they could really come together on an annual basis to network and collaborate. And every year it continues to grow at scale. We've grown to one of the largest events in its capacity that's currently serving the military community. Mm. We had 916 registered attendees. There's over 700 people walking around here right now. That's fantastic. And all of us are here for the same reason. We want to connect. We want access to people we can't normally touch. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, we want to collaborate and come up with great, great creative ways to do things different for ourselves, our brands, our businesses, and most importantly, our community. So tell me, why do you think veterans are enticed by your, your conference compared to other conferences? It's different. Um, I'm an individual. And so when they see someone that just retired from the military start this labor of love to solve his own problems, right? And they see how big it's, grown, how big it's become, mm -hmm. how inspiring it is. That also inspires them to learn more about me personally. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, what is this fuss all about? Mm -hmm. And it's incredibly grassroots, right? So what happens is like, uh, you know, uh, an influencer, right? Let's talk influencers for a minute. Every single person here is a leader in some way, shape, or form. Now, in the Army, I was taught that leadership is the process of influencing others to accomplish a mission, mm -hmm. giving clear-cut purpose, direction, and motivation, right? Mm -hmm. So leadership equals influence. We have a, turn, a, a ton of leaders walking around this conference right now with influence. So when they talk, when they speak, when they tweet, when mm -hmm. they uh, uh, share things across mm -hmm. social media, they're the people they influence, the people they lead online, it opens their eyes and they naturally want to become a part of that. That's contagious, it's very infectious, and people are driven to be a part of something that's different. Our community needs different, and I represent a lot of that. I'm a disruptor in this space, and I think that's attractive to a lot of people. Awesome. And so what is the feedback that you've been getting from the veteran community? The feedback uh, is mostly like, when are you going to bring it here? Mm. Um, however, I'm only one individual. I have a team of military spouses that support me. I wish there was a way for us to support the demand that this conference is now starting to generate. So we're brainstorming, we're looking at ideas, how to take um, this model, sort of shrink it down so we can serve more, uh, more communities who could really benefit of a networking event of this style. So what does that look like when you say you're gonna shrink it down? So this is a three and a half day event. Um, when we go to San Antonio next year, it'll be four days, right? Okay. So the, the annual conference is large in scope, but what we could do is do kind of like what we did last night. We do a series of curated talks and a networking event fo focused around entrepreneurship or a very specific theme. Now that model, we could uh, uh, pop it up virtually in, in any city across the country. So when I say how do we how do we grow, but at the same time, you know, we grow in capacity, we grow with the, with the uh, individuals that we can overall serve. It requires me to shrink this down just a tad, 
put it in a box and create things at a smaller scale to really determine if the local community will buy into it mm -hmm. enough to help it thrive in that space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So as an entrepreneur, my goal is to make sure that not only am I doing great things um, for the community, I also have to be concerned about how I pay the bills. And I'm not talking about my bills, I'm talking about the bills that I actually take to do this, right? Yeah. So any place that we go, we have to make sure that whatever it is is able to support itself. Absolutely. And not take away from the annual event that we already have right now. Absolutely. Okay, so I operate in the women's veteran space. Mm -hmm. So do you know off, off the top how many female entrepreneurs are here and has that grown over the last few years? As this conference continues to grow, we recognize that there are segments in our community mm -hmm. that are underserved mm -hmm. that need the opportunity to connect and collaborate with one another. So yes, we'll have the massive event, but most importantly, we'll trim down some of the uh, breakout sessions and do curated sort of meet and greets or curated sessions for people that are in those communities. Mm -hmm. So women veterans, how could I create an afternoon event and engagement specifically for women veterans? We created a track for military spouses mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. and look at the demand and look at how far that's grown. Yeah. Well, next year, of course, we can add in a segment specifically for women veterans mm -hmm. so we can talk specific to your needs mm -hmm. and address it with the platform that we have and also the partners that are here supporting us. And I'm glad to hear that because there was a meetup group just for women veterans and, and we took over that bar. And that's where it started. <laughs> so I'm the type of leader where I don't always recognize what the soldiers believe me want. Yeah. You know, so I, a candid feedback is incredibly important. So when I um, when, when I saw um, uh, when I saw that meetup being posted on the app, I'm like, huh. I shot the organizer an email and I said, hey, look, I like this idea. What I want you to do, though, is because I don't have the time to manage it. If I found a sponsor, if I gave you a venue, could you do this at scale? And she said yes. So now we have something that will directly plug into our event for 2020 that's specifically for women veterans. At the end of the day, MIC is nothing more than a name. Mm -hmm and it's a location and it's a set of dates. Mm -hmm. Now inside of those dates, there will be multiple tracks, there will be multiple summits, there will be multiple networking activities to serve the wider community. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I, I, I kind of don't like about our space is that we're incredibly tribal. So you have <laughs> veterans over here, yeah. then the women veterans break off and yeah. do their own thing. Yeah. Now I get it, we all have unique and special needs. Yeah. However, this place, MIC or MIC, will always be a place where I try to do my best to bring the community back together. Yeah. Because great things happen when we kind of like break down the walls that are in front of us. Yeah. When we find a high speed military spouse doing phenomenal things and connect her with a female veteran off um, doing phenomenal things. You put the two of them together, yeah. ideas start to fly, collaboration happens, and before you know it, a new venture is launched. Yeah, I want to encourage stuff like that, and this is the perfect place to do it. Absolutely, so what would you tell a veteran who's going online, they're Googling, they find your, your conference, what would you tell that, that veteran to do? So one, um, make the time to come, right? <laughs> um, and two, don't come up with any reason on why you can't attend. This is different, it's unique. Listen to what people say on social media. You don't have to listen to me. I'm not a voice, well, some people say I'm a voice in a space, but I don't tweet. I don't post much content online. I prefer to operate in a backdrop and let my actions speak louder than anything that I can possibly say about myself. This here is a rarity for me, okay? I think in front of a camera, this is the third time in my adult life. Wow. I prefer to operate behind the scenes and literally actions speak louder than words. Last question. So what challenges have you overcome from your first conference to now? Is self-doubt, okay? Um, when I came up with this idea back in 2015, I sat down with uh, uh, USAA and I kind of talked them through this concept. They weren't fond of it back then, right? Mm. And so that was incredibly intimidating. I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. I'm doing something I've never done before. I'm presenting my idea to a potential sponsor, which I didn't even know they would be a sponsor at that time because I, wasn't, I didn't understand the concepts yet. Um, but I stepped out on faith, I took action, mm -hmm. and it's grown from that seed. So I went from that no to getting a yes 90 days later, mm. and then, you know, I, I continued to step out. I continued to have faith that this would come through, and through my own ambition, through my own drive, I found the right connectors, the influencers I needed mm -hmm. to continue helping me to spread the word, and it slowly started spreading out from there. And what should we expect from your San Antonio make next year? Um, a more robust event that's going to be a little bit more targeted along the realm of entrepreneurship. What I would like to do is uh, have the conference segmented in four different areas. We have entrepreneurship and then several themes that fall between that to suit any type of entrepreneur. So if you're in a tech space, if you're in innovation, yeah. if you're in fintech, if you're looking at starting a brick and mortar business yeah. or whatever that looked like, there will be curated content to support you. 
social impact, the nonprofit space. They say that there's 45,000 nonprofits um, that are supporting military veterans, and service members, veterans, and spouses, right? However, there's more and more that start every single day. Yeah. And in a lot of cases, they're like trying to repeat things that are already in existence. I believe our community needs more collaboration. I want MIC to be a place for nonprofit organizations to collaborate. I want to focus on two unique segments, just like you mentioned, <laughs> uh, women veterans and Thank also you. the military spouses. Yeah. And then most importantly, this conference has a digital marketing aspect to it. Because I don't care who you are, a nonprofit leader, a freelancer, or someone launching a business, we all need a domain name, we all need a website, mm -hmm. and we need a way to drive traffic to our medium, being that website, so the wider community have an understanding of who we are and what we're doing. At our core, there's so many lessons that can be taken from the speakers here at the event, yep. and we also want to continue to scale the type of speakers we have at the conference. You know, How can we bring the Gary V's of the world into the military space, yeah. right? Yeah. But at a reduced price point, right? Yeah. So instead of you buying a ticket at $700 to sit in a high-speed conference, why couldn't you come, for the, come to an event like this for a seventh of the price? I you know, agree. And I that's agree. what I want to do. I want to bring uh, high-speed and dynamic speakers to educate and empower our community, but I don't want to do it with all the extra fluff that goes along with it. I don't think that's necessary. I'm thankful to you. I'm proud of you for doing it. <laughs> and continue to do the great work that you're doing. Thank you, ma'am. I really appreciate that. This veteran has seen a lot in her 101 years, including her service as a lieutenant in the Women's Army Corps during World War II. Here is Millie sharing part of her story in her own words. I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and of course everything was completely segregated there, and there weren't many very good jobs that, to be had there. So a cousin of mine had gone into the wax, and I decided that that would be a good choice. I did basic training at Fort Des Moines and also officer candidate training there, and after I was commissioned, I was sent first to Fort McClellan, Alabama, and then to Fort Benning. And in both of those, I was one of the commanders in charge of the WAC detachments when I was at Fort McClellan in Alabama. The first time that I went into town by myself, I think the town was Anniston, I had on my little second lieutenant bar and walking proudly and a white couple were near me and she looked toward me and she said, look at that black bitch and she spit toward me. Fortunately, the spit didn't hit me and I never reacted, I never let her know that I knew she had done that even. And I, of course, didn't react because back then was when they were still lynching people. It would have been futile if I wanted to react, it would have been stupid. We met uh, because I was uh, a new police officer in Howard County and uh, we were assigned to neighborhood liaisons. And uh, Mrs. Bailey and her husband, Mr. Bill Bailey, were uh, neighborhood liaisons. Uh, and we just hit it off immediately. So we adopted each other after that, and we've been together ever since. It's been 35 great years. On the side of things that I will never forget and that are wonderful, when I was going to, to uh, Fort Sam Houston to go to Ashton General School. General Ulio, who was the Adjutant General of the Army, the top, I would say like the top administrative person in the Army, General Ulio, was going there to address my class. And when we got into to Fort San Antonio, we were going to get off the train. And all of this brass these top level people who were stationed there were there to greet the four star general. And I was about three people behind him to disembark the train. And he looked back and said, after you, Lieutenant. So he let me go ahead of him. And the shock of these people who were expecting to greet a four star general, and they looked up and this little brown skinned lady stepped off, and of course, I had to salute them first because they all outranked me and under any condition, under all condition, they had to return the salute, but they certainly weren't going to mess up there with General, General Lugio right behind me. But that was a, a time I can never forget. I wish I had a television of that. It's the one that is the most 
outstanding is having Obama elected as president. That was something that I would never have expected. I was received by him at the White House in May of 2015. Mrs. Obama wasn't able to be there, but she left a nice letter with the president to give me in which she expressed some nice things about me and her regret for not being there. And she included a picture of herself. And she makes beautiful pictures all the time, but this particular one was one of the nicest. They're going to have a veterans monument in downtown Columbia, and they have a park area there. And the one of the parks is sort of divided into three parks, we can say, and one of those is going to be named for me, and that's the one where the monument is going to be located. I've had in a number of honors and received several lifetime achievement awards. I received the first congressional one I received from Congressman Cummings, and then later I received one from President Trump. He became, a, a, went into the Army after I did, and in fact, when he got his second lieutenant commission, I pinned him with my bars, because by that time I was the first lieutenant. So I pinned him with my second lieutenant bars. I read that a school right up the street here, Runningbrook Elementary School, had been given some computer something. I don't use the computer, and I don't even know the right language. But they needed some hardware or software or something. So I call, called the principal and asked her what was it they needed. And she told me, and I said, well, I will buy it, and I did. But then from then on, I started raising money for the school. So I've had a pretty good run of helping running book. And they have a bench there outside with a plaque showing that that bench is dedicated to me. I have an ongoing project. I do care packages for our deployed soldiers been doing that for a number of years. I was sent a flag that was flown in my honor while they were actually on a mission, and they sent me the flag already mounted, and also a certificate of authenticity. A lot of people think you have to have a lot of money to do some good, and that's not true. So again and again, I've tried to encourage people to share their blessings with other people. Hello, my name is Eric Montalvo. I'm the founding partner of the Federal Practice Group, a DC-based law firm. We serve those who serve. Uh, we're veteran-owned, we have veterans that work for us, and in anticipation of Veterans Day, we'd like to extend our thanks for those fellow veterans who have sacrificed in defense of our nation, and we wish them well and appreciate their service. Our next story is inspired by our executive producer, Rodney Miner, who recently became an advocate for prostate cancer. Veterans in Transition brought together veterans who have battled different forms of cancer to share their stories. Pastor Michael Bell introduces the keynote speaker. What will not be deleted from your minds, your memories, all of the presenters who've shared out of their souls, out of their hearts. You could not just hear them, but you could feel them. So this has been a day of great wealth for veterans. And again, I commend and thank you all for your services and the support group and network around you. Our presenter is keynote, and he is Mr. Carl Sharperson, Jr., the veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Stage four, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He's also quite an innovator, quite a leader, quite a strategist, has helped many organizations, has served in capacities of at least three Fortune 500 companies, as well as an international sports company and as a VP of manufacturing. 2000, he started his own business, his own company. 
is executive leadership, where he specializes in public speaking, team building, strategic planning, professional recruiting, and the list goes on and on and on. How gifted, how privileged we are to be under these next few moments as he pours out of the wealth and resources of his own knowledge, experience, and out of his heart to all of us. Put your hands together. Let's welcome Mr. Carl Sharperson. Good afternoon. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C., probably three miles from here. I actually went to my old neighborhood as I was coming in, River Terrace. My dad was a World War II Marine with the Mumford Point Marines, which were the Marines that were uh, Marines before they were integrated. And um, at the age of 14, he moved us to Spotsylvania, Virginia, 60 miles south of Washington, D.C. I went from an all-black environment to integrating the school. During the same time period as the movie Remember the Titans, my experiences were very similar. Ninth grade, I go up for football for the first time. I'd never played tackle football before. I'd played touch football, I was fast, I could catch a ball, throw a ball, but I'd never played tackle football. So I go off for tackle football. Coach Sparks gives a talk that I'll never forget. He said, you got your pads today. If you don't want to play, turn in your pads. If you come back tomorrow, I need you to stay until the end of the season because quitters never win and winners never quit. He said, if you quit my football team, you might quit school. You quit school, get married, you might quit your spouse. Have kids, you might quit your, quit your kids because once you quit the first time, it's easier to quit the next time. So I developed a mindset that I was never going to quit. So I go out for football. Again, I'd never played tackle football before. Got my head bashed in, didn't have fun, didn't like it, but I was not going to quit. My sophomore year, I'm sweeping up the uh, locker room. Coach Sparks says, Carl, what do you want to do after high school? I said, I don't know, coach. He said, well, if you apply yourself, I will help you get an athletic scholarship. That was the first time in my mind I'd even thought of an athletic scholarship or going to college for free. My uh, senior year in high school, I was the most valuable player of the team. I played offensive, um, wide receiver, defensive back, and I was a place kicker. And I made All-American team and MVP, right? If I had quit, that never would have happened. So sometimes if you just hang in there, people will quit around you. My senior year in high school, I get called to the office. I don't know why I get called to the office. Me and two other guys that played ball with me. We go to the office. We're sitting down, we're talking to each other, say, why, why are we at the office? In walks this guy, six foot two, 230 pounds, blue suit, white shirt, blue tie, white cover, says, I'm from the Naval Academy and I want to recruit you to play football. I graduated from high school in 1971. The Vietnam War was still going on. The other two guys said, you know what? I'm out of here. I am not going to Vietnam. So they left. I stayed and listened because my dad told me, never turn down an opportunity that you've never been offered. Always listen. So I listened. Went home and talked it over with him. He said, that's, that's a pretty good opportunity, son. Nobody else was knocking on the door saying, here's free money, right? So I said, you know, I'm going for it. And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to put everything in that I can to go. So I fill out all the applications. It's pretty daunting because in order to go to one of the service academies, you're talking SAT, 14, 1,500. You're talking 90% uh, captains of a varsity football team, two, two different letters sometimes. Uh, 20% Eagle Scouts, I mean, the, 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 the competition is just huge, right? So I never thought about doing that. So I couldn't go straight in. They sent me to a prep school in Harlington, Texas, called Marine Military Academy. Got on a plane for the first time. Went to the southern tip of Texas. Played football and learned to study for the first time. I didn't realize that in order to study, you look at a book. If you don't understand, you read the book again. If you don't understand, you read it again. I had never known that. I was, good at, I was good in math. 
uh, and I, I was good in grammar, didn't like to read, but I didn't know that. So I learned to study for the first time. I get my appointment to the Naval Academy. I'm in class, first class. Um, I'm taking chemistry, because everybody's an engineer at the Naval Academy, right? I'm taking chemistry, right? After about two weeks, it's clear that that instructor is talking French, and I don't understand French. <laughs> so I go to the instructor, but before that, I cried myself at night and said, Lord, what am I going to do? Because I ain't getting this, right? Talk to the instructor. Uh, he talks it over a little bit, and I understand a little bit more, but I committed that I was going to spend more time in chemistry than the other subjects put together. So I did that. I made a B in chemistry both semesters. Again, quitters never win, and winners never quit. Played varsity football at the Naval Academy. Graduated, decided to go into the Marine Corps. Not only did I decide to go into the Marine Corps, I decided to become a pilot in the Marine Corps. First day of pilot school, ground school, you know what they tell you? They say the attrition rate is 66%, which means only one out of three of you guys, or, or it was all guys at the time, are going to graduate. What did I do? I looked to the left. I looked to the right. I said, sorry, y'all not going to be here because I'm going to be here. Because Coach Sparks said quitters never win and winners never quit. So I'm going to be here. So I matriculate through that. Did five and a half years in the Marine Corps, did two six-month Mediterranean cruises, one three-month cruise to the Carib, got out. Decided to work for Procter & Gamble. I worked for Procter & Gamble for five and a half years, manufacturing, engineering operations in Albany, Georgia, Cincinnati, Ohio. I worked for um, Frito-Lay for three years in Indianapolis, Indiana, making chips, Santitas, Tostitas, Doritos, all that kind of stuff. Then I went to work for uh, Colgate Palm Olive in Topeka, Kansas, uh, as a plant manager for a union facility. That was the first time I'd ever worked in a union facility. Uh, work was in Topeka, Kansas for six years, uh, and then uh, got the calling to be closer to home. My parents were living in Virginia. My wife's from Florida, uh, and I got a job in uh, South Carolina. So that's kind of what brought me to South Carolina. Um, after about six, six months to nine months, it became clear that my boss and I agreed to disagree when I, was, when I came to South Carolina, right? So after about a year, we departed ways. And I departed ways, and I said, what am I going to do? Well, I said, I can, I can speak, I can do consulting, I can do several things. So I hung out the shingle and started doing that in 2000. In uh, December 23rd, 2010, I go in for a routine colonoscopy. The doctor says everything looks good, no polyps, no nothing. I go to Florida to visit with my wife's family, uh, and all of a sudden my stomach starts hurting. I don't know what it is, but it starts hurting. Right? I can't lay on my stomach, can't lay on my back. Come back and talk to the doctor. I said, Doc, my stomach hurts. He said, well, uh, let me give you these pills. Came back a week, nothing. Let me give you these pills. Come back for a week, nothing. So I finally came back, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do an x-ray of your stomach. So he does an x-ray of my stomach, and I get a call at work. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting at the desk, uh, and he says, uh, Carl, um, I see enlarged lymph nodes in your stomach, and I'm going to refer you to an oncologist. First time I heard the C word. Anybody that's ever heard the C word? I thought about three things. Number one, how long am I going to be here? Number two, how am I going to spend my time, and who am I going to do it with? Those were the three things that went through my mind at that time. I didn't care about how much stuff I had. I didn't care about how much money I had in the bank. Those were the things that were going through my mind at that point in time. So what became important? Three things. I believe in the trilogy, right? So we three things again. Faith, family, and friends. Those were the top priorities. That other stuff didn't count. Faith, family, and friends. So I go see a specialist to do a bunch of tests. We're talking biopsies, PET scan, CAT scan, uh, bone marrow. It took about three weeks for all those tests that they were doing. It seems like it took two years. I mean, it, it seemed like forever. And at that, during that time period, I'm continuously getting sick, sicker and sicker and sicker. By the time I was diagnosed, I looked like I was seven months pregnant, sunken face, sunken arms, sunken legs. I looked like one of those starving kids from Africa. That's what I looked like by the time I was um, diagnosed. So I get the diagnosis, and uh, the diagnosis was stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
there is no stage five, right? So I can remember uh, meeting my um, um, caseworker. My wife and I go in and talk to the caseworker, and my wife's a little crying, and uh, the caseworker says, Carl, you can beat this thing, but you gotta have a positive mind. You gotta have a positive attitude in order to beat this thing. Again, quitters never win, and winners never quit. If you tell your body you're gonna die, you will die. Your body's gonna follow your mind, right? So I come in, that, that, so that was the diagnosis, and uh, so then we gotta deal with it, right? They give me the uh, treatment of six rounds of chemotherapy, three weeks apart. That was the, that was the uh, treatment plan. So I had a concoction of four different chemicals. I don't know the names of them. All I know is one of them was called the Red Devil. And the Red Devil is the one that takes your hair out. That's all I remember, the Red Devil. So I go through the, can go through the, uh, the chemo. But during that time period, there were some people that came along beside me. That was critical because it's all about relationships. There was a lady that lived up the street named Diane. Diane was a breast cancer survivor. Diane called me after I had my first chemotherapy treatment, and she said, Carl, I just want to tell you that while I was going through chemotherapy, I did what I called my chemo walk. She walked every day, even when she was going through chemotherapy. So I started doing that too, walking every day. I walked for the first time with a 14-year-old in the neighborhood, and we walked a block, two blocks, three blocks, up to two, two I got to walking up to, uh, to two hours you know, later on. But that was part of the, the therapy. But the other thing was this. When you're going through stuff and you, you're sitting in that um, chair getting the infusions, getting the chemo, all you got to do is, is you don't have nothing to do. It's just you and the Lord if you know the Lord. And old Slufa is just, he's talking all kinds of stuff. You can't do that. You're going to die saying all that stuff, right? So what I did was I did one of three things. I would say one of three scriptures. I would either say, either say the Lord's Prayer, the Prayer of Jabez, or the 23rd Psalm. And I would just say it over and over and over. If I was sitting in the bed or lying in the bed and couldn't go to sleep, I'd say those verses over and over and over, Replace, replacing the negative with the positive. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. So I did that. Uh, so that was very instrumental in Diana telling me that. Okay? Uh, I had another um, guy that graduated from Naval Academy with me, a guy named Stan. Right? Stan sent me a book. Stan sent me a book called I Choose to Fight. The book is by a guy named Tommy Harper. Tommy Harper was a freshman when I was a sophomore at the Naval Academy. Tommy came in, played football, six foot three, 230 pounds, tight end. Tommy came to the Naval Academy and he worked his way up to the depth chart as a freshman as the second string tight end when we were going to play Michigan. But during the summer, plebe summer, he had some issues. He was throwing up, his stomach was hurting, he was losing weight, all that stuff was going on. So the doctors told him, just before that game, he says, not only are you not going to play in that game, we're going to have to do emergency surgery on you. Tommy had surgery for testicular cancer. He was 19 years old, testicular cancer, right? They gave Tommy an 8% chance to live six months. That was the diagnosis. Now, this was in 1973. Can you imagine what chemotherapy was in 1973? He describes in his book, syringe in the arm. That's the chemo. Radiation, you go to a dark dungeon and sit in this cold dungeon and get zapped. So as Tommy's talking to me about what was going on in 1973, I'm thinking, shoot, if Tommy can go through that, I can go through what I'm going through. So that, that whole thing about hope is, is powerful and positive. And uh, so I went through that, and uh, Tommy ended up living until he was 55 years old. Had two kids. They said, you're going to die in six months, and you're not going to have a child. Right? So I'm going through this, and I'm thinking, oh, Tommy. So anyway, so the other th person that came alongside me was uh, a guy named uh, Colonel Whitley. Colonel Whitley was a colonel. Uh, and he was the head of my son and daughter's Air Force Junior ROTC program. And my wife and I were having breakfast one day. We hear this noise. We look out. We see these people doing some stuff. My wife looks again. That's Colonel Whitley and Miss Ann. 
Colonel Whitley uh, hired a, a lawn care service to do my lawns for an entire year. It's an entire year because we had developed a bond. We had developed a relationship, right? And that's one of the things that the military does. It's a common bond. Um, and then the other thing that happened was not only was I sick, I was broke. I was broke and sick. So I had to humble myself and say, I mean, I was, I mean, I didn't know what to do. I said, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, to just reach out. So I contacted a guy named Kevin. Kevin was the president of the Alumni Association at the Naval Academy. Kevin called a guy named Keith. Keith was a company mate of mine at the Naval Academy. Keith put together a GoFundMe program before GoFundMe was in existence. My classmates and alumni supported me financially for an entire year, an entire year. That's the brotherhood that you get because of relationships. Right Now, the other thing that I found out, because I was getting treated at the VA in Columbia, South Carolina, there's this thing called contaminated water. Contaminated water, if you were in the Marine Corps and you were stationed at Camp Lejeune between 1986 and, no, 1956 and 1986, the Marine Corps was dumping solvents in six different wa water streams. So I put in a claim for that. Seven years later, I finally got some compensation. Finally got some compensation. So after six rounds of chemotherapy, I was diagnosed cancer free. <laughs> Only because of God. Only because of God. So through, throughout, so what I have done is I have written a book about my life. It's called Sharp Leadership, Overcome Adversity to Lead with Authenticity. It talks about my life. I call it a manual for overcoming adversity in any environment, in any stage of life. I've had a 10-year-old read it. 99-year-old great-great-grandmother read it. I had a 90-year-old 90 90 year Naval Academy graduate purchase 10, 4 for his sons, 6 for his grandsons. Bowie State just purchased 100 books for their, their uh, coaches coming on, on campus this year. I had a pastor use it as a Bible study. Um, there's a program at Clemson called Call Me Mister. I'm an honorary mister. They purchase all my books before somebody comes in the program. It's a program to get African-American males into elementary schools. Um, I had a 17-year Marine Corps veteran got out of Marine Corps with post-traumatic stress disorder, became a substance abuser, then he became homeless. Now he runs a shelter for homeless veterans. He said it's the first book he ever read from cover to cover in his life. My role and goal in life is to get that book and those principles in the hands of as many people as possible. What I have learned is everybody's been bullied at least some point in time in their life. You're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too black, you're too white, you're too something. Everybody's been bullied. Everybody's had um, some, some, some sickness in their life, death in their, in their, in their, in their home, uh, and everybody's had some challenges in life. So it relates to everybody. Now, so when you think about the military, I think about brotherhood or sisterhood. Or another way of saying it is, I am my brother's keeper. Or another way of saying it is, somebody already coined the term, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. I served in the U.S. Navy on the destroyer DD-619 USS Edwards. Served in the Pacific for four years. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of my old buddies who now have passed away and have been in the service, and especially all the people, the veterans and people of service today. All the men and women should be appreciated. Jennifer Pilcher is the CEO of Patriot Boot Camp a nonprofit organization that supports veterans and military spouses. Jen is also the creator of Mill Spouse Fest, the largest series of events for military spouses held across the country. Now we're here at Capital One, right, right here at Tysons Corner, Virginia. You know, you're here for the Bravo Conference. You know, what brings you here? I'm here today as a military spouse entrepreneur. I started my own company called Military One Click back in 2012 and there were hardly any resources available for veteran entrepreneurs, but there were almost none available for military spouse entrepreneurs. So I learned about an organization actually called Patriot Boot Camp uh, that helped uh, people start and grow their business. So I attended that and that is really an organization that helped me learn how to start and grow my business. And similar to here today at Capital One, 
having people meet with subject matter experts, listening to incredible speakers like Dakota Meyer today, uh, really helps you as a, especially early stage entrepreneur learn how to do this uh, better. So let me get this straight. In a, span of, in a span of seven years, essentially, you went from military one click, you volunteered at Patriot Boot Camp, and now your role at Patriot Boot Camp is what? Uh, CEO. <laughs> You're the CEO in yes. less than seven, seven years. Yeah. So obviously, there was an entrepreneurial spirit about you, and there's a certain drive. So, what, I mean, what catapulted you to be the CEO of Patriot Boot Camp? Uh, how would you classify that? that transition? I think I would not be able to fulfill the CEO role if I hadn't really went through all the ups and downs of my own business. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when you're going through really hard times in your own business, which we all do, uh, you, you can't really see why and what's next and what why you're going through that. Mm -hmm. But I think now looking back all those experiences, learning experiences are now helping me as the CEO and to help other military spouse and veteran entrepreneurs, hopefully not to make the same uh, mistakes, but if they do, to help them guide it. So I really think the experience I had real world of building my company and having it acquired has helped better equip me for the CEO position at Patriot Boot Camp. And what do you think about the opportunities now? What have you seen in the last seven years for opportunity for spouses and their opportunities now compared to when you come in? I mean. It yeah. seems almost exponential in growth. It, it is. Uh, so when I first started back in 2012, like I said, I really didn't, I knew maybe a handful of other military spouse entrepreneurs. Going to Patriot Boot Camp, there was about four of us out of the total 50 cohort. Now uh, we have the program coming up in Utah and we're right at 40% um, females. Some of them are female uh, veterans, but there's also uh, female military spouses. So the numbers have dramatically increased for military spouse entrepreneurs and we were here today at capital one talking about why is that and i think it's really interesting that um, looking at why a military spouse becomes an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur is sometimes very different than a veteran's reason for doing it uh, for me personally mm -hmm. I was a speech language pathologist and it required licensure for every state we moved to. And we were on about our fourth PCS and every time you have to apply, you have to wait. So I also saw a need in the military community for this all-in-one type resource. Um, so it was really out of necessity for a job. So I decided to create my own and then uh, I made it remote so I could take it wherever we moved and the funny story is we haven't moved since. <laughs> uh, so it just was that um, journey of learning and being part of all the ups and downs of business ownership that now I can apply those lessons to Patriot Boot Camp and here I am this full circle in life which is really neat and Taylor McLemore the founder of Patriot Boot Camp is still very much involved in the organization and um, I just feel truly blessed that I'm, I'm in this position now to help. So today on the panel, what did you discuss and what did you come uh, come away with? Any takeaways from the conference today? Yeah, so we uh, just had a great panel. Uh, Megan Ogilvie from Dog Tag Bakery and Liz O'Brien from Hiring Our Heroes. Um, and we were up there really talking about, for all of us, um, how important mentorship has been to each of us with growing our company. And Danielle, I'm sorry, another, she was a veteran and a military spouse. Um, how mentorship really helped shape our companies and how important it is to find that. And uh, you know, through Patriot Bootcamp, we set you up one-on-one -on -one with a mentor and you might not click with all of them, but the ones that you do are really the ones that I think really help and shape you. And then all of us have really hired. Um, and ironically, we all hired military spouses. Um, and something about that must be intuitive because we never called each other to find out who we should hire and hire military spouses. I think they're in your network and your community. Mm -hmm. And you know they had an expertise, either currently or previous work being a military spouse. Um, the nice part is they're usually available for more virtual remote work. Um, they don't need the health benefits, so they're great for a 1099. So I really built the team up at Military One Click with military spouses who were literally stationed around the world. Um, so we talked a lot about that on the panel is how important mentorship has been to all of us and how building up your team by using other military spouses or veterans uh, to pay as part of your employees or 1099. 
You've mentioned uh, Patriot Boot Camp a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about PBC? Where can we find it? Who's eligible for it? Um, what's it all about? Yeah, so it's uh, PatriotBootCamp.org. We are a 501c3 independent nonprofit. We operate technically out of um, Boulder, Colorado, uh, but we have a small and mighty team that is stationed uh, also actually around the world. We have a military spouse who works with us in uh, Berlin, Germany. And what the program does is it takes early stage entrepreneurs, very early, one to two years, even ideation, and bring them to a certain area, location in the country. It always changes. We're being hosted by MX out in Lehigh, Utah. And we bring in 21 speakers from around the country that volunteer their time and expertise. We bring in 43 mentors who, um, a lot of them are repeat mentors. And they could be from large companies like founders of SendGrid and Twilio and uh, these amazing tech companies, as well as attorneys. Some of them are veterans themselves who've become attorneys, who own their own practice. They come and volunteer and give you that one-on-one -on -one mentorship time. So we have, uh, over the course of the weekend, our entrepreneurs are able to meet with eight different mentors that they pick uh, for 20-minute sessions. And then uh, we also throw some fun activity in there, and uh, I think we're headed out for axe throwing, team building. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's just, and we were talking about this on the panel too here today, uh, how important it is to meet your community of peers. Um, the military thread for, through Patriot Bootcamp is you have to be either a veteran, mill spouse, active duty member, caregiver. So that's what connects us all through Patriot Bootcamp. But once you get there, it's like a level playing field for being an entrepreneur. You know, you're gonna learn how to be an entrepreneur first. And it's your service and military background or connection that is really just um, what brings us there. So for those veterans that are hard charging this, you know, they gotta, they're focused on mission, they're focused on setting up the company, the spouses out there that's trying to manage the home, manage the, you know, manage your business. You just went through all that laundry list of activity out there, but how do you convince them to, one, take a look at your website, two, apply, and make time to apply? What would you, what would you say? Yeah, so I think it is a difficult decision. Um, and it is really hard, I think, as entrepreneurs to invest in ourselves first, especially probably military. It's, you know, you are always, as a veteran, um, serving others. So I think you've got to really think that this is an investment in yourself and your company. Uh, they do have to pay their own travel and hotel. We take care of everything else. But so there is an investment side of it. Um, there's a commitment and it's hard and we acknowledge that when they get there but then we also say like you're here you made the commitment now put on the out of office up and really be here and be present well wow, that's amazing <laughs> so hopefully five years from now we'll have a conversation we can look back and say wow look at what you've done yeah so. yeah well it's team effort uh i'm very fortunate sherry rice has been the heart and soul of our program she's been there since day one taylor our founder we have a great board and then I just stole back two of my, my best people from my former company to come work at Patriot Boot Camp. So we are a small but mighty team, and uh, we're thrilled to have veterans just like you coming out to the program and uh, keep growing it. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. The Department of Veterans Affairs has a new program called the Women Veteran-Owned Small Business Initiative. I had the chance to sit down and talk with Michelle garner Ince about the program and what it means to the VA and to women business owners. Hi, Michelle. Hi. Tell me about the Women Veteran-Owned Small Business Initiative. The uh, Women Veteran-Owned Small Business Initiative is the vision of our executive director, Ruby Harvey. Um, she is our first female executive director of the Office of Small Business at the VA. And uh, it was her vision to close the gap um, of women veteran opportunities within the VA. Currently, as you probably know, VA is the only federal agency by law who has to give a certain portion of its contracts to veterans. And as part of that, we certify or verify veteran-owned small businesses. And we currently have about 13,000 um, verified, but only 9% of them are women veterans. So there is the catalyst of this program. How did this program come about? Well, first of all, Ms. Harvey asked uh, that we research and look at uh, women businesses um, in general 
and there's um, a challenge on getting access to decision makers. Uh, there is also a case where women oftentimes deal with balance, right? So they're, they're, they've served their country, they are um, um, excellent at what they do, but they also have families to take care of. Um, also, a couple of the other challenges identified with sexism. So when, when women are uh, approaching decision makers, sometimes um, uh, uh, if they have a man with them, then the focus is on the male versus the female CEO. So this program is, is really about um, uh, helping women overcome those challenges. And it's not just for women veterans, but it is specifically this program's for women veterans, but those are challenges that several uh, uh, women, regardless of their, their veteran status, have. In the program, we were asked to fill out um, different surveys. Mm -hmm. Were there any surprises in the surveys? I would say the sexism was a surprise to me. I wasn't expecting that. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, a couple of the other challenges are um, that um, women don't necessarily partner with each other. And I think that's one of the great surprises about this program is that uh, the women, the 29 women within the program are, um, are sisters in arms. Uh, you know, they were sister in arms as, as veterans, now they're sisters in business. And uh, several of them are seeking each other out to look at possibly teaming or partnering. And that brings me great joy. How did you go about picking the topics? We looked at um, uh, challenges that any veteran business, any business might have. Um, then uh, prior to the program starting, we did uh, group sessions of 45 minutes uh, amongst with uh, four and five uh, business owners at a time. And during that period, we talked about some of their personal and professional challenges, and that's how we determined what topics we we're going to talk about. What does this program mean to you? It's a delight. It is, I, I, as I told uh, um, Ms. Harvey, this is the most fun I've had in my federal career, and, and, and that'll be eight years uh, in December, and for several reasons. Um, we all come to the VA, most people, especially veterans, come to the VA to serve. Um, but sometimes it's hard to see and touch those veterans that we're serving. And this program has allowed me to continue something that I've done uh, my entire uh, adult career, uh, and that is to serve military members and their families, and in this case, the 29 women who are in this program. How would you determine if this program is successful? Well, I think that that's uh, different for each woman because, um, you know, some women want to be a $100 million company. Mm -hmm. Some women just would like to be a million dollar company uh, because the, the women range from uh, a negative $25,000 loss, we have two uh, startups, all the way up to uh, 11 million, uh, or I should say north of 11 million. Um, so uh, that's different to different people. I think uh, if, if uh, the women learn to, uh, to do business better, smarter, um, I think that's success. I think if the one who is at $25,000 million, $25, loss uh, gets to 100000 that's winning. Um, but most of all, I think uh, just for them to know that the VA is here to educate, empower, and engage them, I think is, is a win. Because uh, as I told um, the group, um, it's rare that you're going to have uh, the second largest uh, federal agency in the government give you this kind of attention. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something that's a win. Mm -hmm. And that our leadership has committed to that effort. I absolutely applaud the organization, the agency, for doing something like this. Uh, another lady, Audrey, and I were talking exactly about this, is that it we don't know of another program right. um, within the federal agency, even commercially, that's happening that's similar to something that's at this scope and magnitude. So we certainly applaud the agency for doing something like this and for making this investment. So thank you uh, for driving that. How 
do you see this program continuing? Do you mm. see a continuum? Absolutely. I believe the leadership is committed to it continuing. Um, I, I call the ladies, the vet biz ladies are uh, amazing and uh, they are um, paving the way for many future um, cohorts as I, as I call them. Uh, the, the plan for next year is that we will um, uh, have double the amount of ladies. So we started out with 30, we now have 29. Uh, I'm, I'm projecting that we'll have uh, 60 women who will go through the program. Um, I also see that this will become an alumni association, so the ladies like yourself who are in the program now will become mentors to future. Uh, cohorts and this will create an entire movement and as uh, one of my colleagues reminded me you know veteran women is the largest growing group of veterans that we serve so um, I see that um, uh, and hope that more women will not just seek to transition from the military and go work for somebody that they would create their own economic opportunity by being business owners if you want to start a business and you are a female veteran. Seek out these ladies, they are very generous, like yourself, um, with uh, their knowledge, with their expertise, and uh, thank you so much for all that you've done and all the, the example you're setting for, uh, for these ladies. It's tremendous. Thank you, it's truly my pleasure. Um, I think uh, all of us are encouraged by others and uh, we're very excited about giving back. That's what pushes all of us forward. That's it for this episode of Veterans in Transition. We ask that you like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Remember, we all have a story to tell. Until next time. Thank you.